hearts to celebrate this most wonderful gift of God. God's love comes into the world in a unique and holy way with the birth of Jesus. Now we're going to read our village statement as a reminder of who we are and why we're here. Please follow along. We are the village church. When we gather in community, we remember that God is with us. We are that we are imperfect people who make mistakes. We give thanks that God loves us anyway. In this community, we practice patience, compassion, and forgiveness. When we leave this gathering, we go out to share God's healing love with the broken world. We are Jesus' instruments of hope in our world. We are followers of Jesus, and we can change the world. At this point in time, we can dismiss the children to go downstairs. Those of them, that those of you, it doesn't look like there are any today, so never mind. Uh, if you would uh, bow your heads and pray with me, please. Oh God, we are thankful. We are thankful for this life, these experiences that you have laid out before us on the path towards salvation. The many gifts that you shower us with every day that go unnoticed, we acknowledge them now. In the stillness, our hearts open to you as we are followers, as we are disciples of Jesus, Lord. You sent Jesus, your only Son. We are ever thankful for the example, for the way, for the life. Let us not forget as we go into this holiday season what it's really about. It's not about us. It's not about buying gifts for others. Lord, it's about turning toward you, renewing our commitment to following Christ. We are followers of Jesus. Let us never forget. This morning is from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. I'll be reading from the message. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. God sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of God's grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies and to comfort all who mourn, to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> Rename them oaks of righteousness, planted by God to display his glory. They'll rebuke the old ruins, raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind and make it new. Because I, God, love fair dealing and hate thievery and crime, I'll pay your wages on time and in full. 
and establish my eternal covenant with you. Your descendants will become well known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people I have blessed. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul. He dressed me up in a suit of salvation. He outfitted me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom who puts on a tuxedo and a bride a jewel tiara. For as the earth bursts with spring wildflowers, and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the master, God, brings righteousness into full bloom and puts praise on display before the nations. ourselves to you in this Advent season as we watch, as we wait for the coming of your Son one more time. We want your love to fill the earth. So God, speak to us anew your word of grace. Speak to us. We are listening. Amen. On July 17th of this year, Eric Gardner died in the neighborhood of Staten Island, New York, after a police officer put on a chokehold around his neck. Chokeholds are against police policy by the New York City Police Department. Gardner was resisting arrest after officers uh, res uh, arrested him for selling single cigarettes. You're not supposed to sell cigarettes individually. Officer Daniel Pantaleo put his arm around Gardner's neck and attempted to pull him backward and down to the ground, and then uh, four other officers pushed him to the ground. You've probably all seen the videos on television or on YouTube. As they were restraining him on the ground, Eric Gardner repeated, I can't breathe, 11 times. They took him away to the hospital in an ambulance. On the way, he had a heart attack, and he was pronounced dead an hour later. The medical examiner ruled his death a homicide. But on December 3rd, a grand jury decided not to indict Officer Pantaleo. Demonstrations have erupted across the country. There was one in Toledo yesterday with people wearing shirts that say, I can't breathe, and with people having die-ins lying on the street. Reverend Jeff Hood, a pastor in Washington, D.C., had this to say about the incident. For me, he says, this is a very religious thing. I don't believe that you can love your neighbor and then kill them. I think people of faith need to demonstrate. We have a fundamental responsibility to be in the streets, to be creating coalitions, and to be building change. I keep thinking about Eric Gardner saying, I can't breathe, and it made me think that's what Jesus is saying in this culture. Jesus is fundamentally connected to the marginalized, and right now Jesus is saying, I can't breathe. I think the church should be saying the same thing, that we can't breathe in this culture, and we have to change this culture in order for us to have breath and exist in society. I think Reverend Hood is right. Not even Jesus can breathe under these circumstances. Something has gone terribly wrong in our culture. Black parents everywhere tell us that they have to have the talk <coughs> with their children, especially their sons. Talk varies, but it includes a terrible question posed by Jonathan Lethem in his book, The Fortress of Solitude. This is the question. At what age is a black boy when he learns that he is scary? You see, this is what it means to be a black boy growing up in America. You learn that you are scary to white people. 
You learn that you have to behave a certain way around police officers because you are, quite frankly, not safe around a police officer. I read this in an article. When you are the parent of a black son, you have to protect your child from a country that is out to get him, a country that kills someone that looks like him every 28 hours. That's by a police officer. A country that will likely imprison him by his mid-30s if he doesn't get a high school education. A country that is more than twice as likely to suspend him from school than a white classmate. Friends, this is wrong. This is what we call systemic racism. There are systems in place that cause these things to happen. There are systems in place that cause black children to be treated differently than white children. This is more than about uh, what college you get into and what job you can get. This is a matter of life and death. You see, it's, it's privilege. It's, it's white privilege that you can walk down the street and not be feared. I can walk down the street. My son can walk down the street and not be feared because of the color of his skin. That's privilege. It's a privilege. <coughs> if Eric Gardner cannot breathe, then... Jesus cannot breathe, and the prophet Isaiah cannot breathe, and God cannot breathe. If anyone is oppressed, then we are all oppressed by an oppressive system. Well, in our scripture for today, Isaiah comes along to a people who are living under oppression. Oppression is not new to our world. And Isaiah offers some promises, some Advent promises. He weaves these promises that that we heard then and we need to hear now. God sent me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the heartbroken, announce freedom to all captives, pardon the prisoners. God has sent me to announce God's amazing grace, messages of joy instead of news of doom. Oh, I love those words. Don't you love those words? It's what we need today, isn't it? Later, Jesus comes along, and he goes up into the temple, and he reads the scripture, and he says, now that you've heard this scripture, you've heard me read it, it's fulfilled in my reading. It's fulfilled. <coughs> you see, God promises to give us the power to make the world this better place. God promises that we can heal the heartbroken. We can free the captive. We can free people who are captive to these unjust systems. We can give messages of joy rather than doom. We have the power to do this, but we're not there yet. We thought when we abolished slavery and when we desegregated the schools and when we passed the Voting Rights Act that we had dealt with our racism. But my friends, those were just first steps. Those were just first steps. Those were structural things and legal things that we could do. But now we hear stories and we see racial tensions flare and we know that our work is not done. I had a conversation yesterday with three black men and with one of their wives. Um, one of them was Ollie Townsend here and Kim Crosby, his wife, who attend the village regularly. And Ollie invited two of his friends, Chris and uh, Corey. And they talked about what it's like to be black men living in Toledo. These men don't consider themselves to be what they call the stereotypical ghetto black men. You know, the kind with the saggy pants who have the, the shiny rims on their tire wheels and who live with their moms because they don't have jobs. I mean, they described that and they said, we're not those kind of ghetto black men, right? This is how they describe themselves. We're just regular guys who got an education. We go to work from nine to five. We wear clothes that fit and we stay out of trouble. They said, but we're not the ones who you see on the news, right? We'll never be on CNN, because we're not the ones that people want to tell stories about. They also told me that they all have family members who fit that description, that stereotype of ghetto black men. But in our conversation, we agreed that ghetto or not, everybody deserves to be treated fairly by all people, including police officers, amen? Kim told the story of when she and Ollie had just moved into Woodville, which is a small little town on the edge of Toledo. And they had just been there, what, two or three weeks? 
a week. And Kim had gone to a diner to eat with a friend of hers, and she had parked her car and gone driving around. A friend had showed her around the town. And when she got back, she noticed that there was a police car parked right next to her car. She thought that was a little bit odd. And she thought to herself, oh my, my, my license plate has expired. So she was a little worried. She got into her car, drove away, and of course, the police pulled her over. And they asked her, you know, about her expired plates, which was reasonable. And then they said to her, where do you live? And she said, well, I just moved into town just recently. And they said, who do you live with? And she said, I live with my husband. And, she, and they said, what's your address? And she gave them the address. And they said, yeah, we know that house. Now, let me ask you, those of you who've been pulled over by the police, how many of you have ever been asked who you live with? Of course not. You've never been asked who you live with. They were letting her know that they did not like a white woman living with a black man in their town. Now, Kim and Ollie told me that in the less than a year that they lived in Woodville, they were pulled over at least five times by the police by, for minor things, if, if anything. They moved out of Woodville because Kim didn't feel safe living there. She didn't want to live in a town like that where they keep getting pulled over. <laughs> These three men told me that they don't drive through Ottawa Hills. No black person in Toledo who's smart drives through Ottawa Hills because they know they'll get pulled over for anything. And they said if they do drive through Ottawa Hills, they always turn their radio down because you always get pulled over for your radio being too loud. Now, for the most part, these three told me that they haven't had a lot of trouble. But they said if they really think about it, they know that as black men, they live with a target on their head. Friends, no one should have to live like that. No one. Isaiah said that he came and, and he alluded that one would come to bring good news to the poor, to bring freedom to the captives. This would give space so that we could all breathe freely. Lots of people in our country can't breathe freely yet. They leave their houses in the morning with a target on their head. And they have to second guess every move so that it won't be misinterpreted. That is no way to live. So, how do we change the world? We breathe. We breathe in the Spirit of God. We boldly ask the Spirit of God to live in us and inspire us. So, we walk down the street and we look in the eyes of a black person and we smile. It's a way to say, I don't find you scary, right? We show an interest. We show that we are loving people and that we are not afraid. That's just one simple step. We live out our baptismal vows. In our baptismal vows, we say that when we see injustice, evil, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves, we will resist those things and we will speak up. Friday, I went to Best Buy, did a little Christmas shopping. As I was leaving, I noticed uh, that the guy at the door, the staff person at the door, waved a woman out. She was carrying a big heavy package, and he said, oh, it's OK, you go on. And then I turned to see that a staff member was leaving, a black man, and he was made to take off his coat and be searched to make sure he wasn't stealing anything. And I turned to the man and I said, do you want me to stop and have you look at my package? And he said, oh no, you're fine. And I walked out of my car and, and I was ashamed. I was ashamed that I didn't go back and say, why did the black staff member have to take off his coat to, to show that he wasn't stealing anything, but you let me and the other white woman just walk out? That would have been me speaking up to injustice and oppression. I, I so wish I had done that. And I kind of want to just go sit at Best Buy and kind of stake out the door and see what it is that they do and who gets, who gets the packages searched and who doesn't. It would have been a way for me to engage in conversation and to just push, push something that I saw that was clearly not right. But we don't pay attention. Every day we let these things go by. But I could 
had paid attention to myself when I was holding my breath because I knew something was wrong. So I have a challenge for us today. There's an invitation in your program today, I mentioned it already, to change the world by participating in a dialogue to change group. These groups are being formed so that citizens in Toledo can have honest conversations about racism. Groups of 10 to 12 people are meeting for two hours a week for six weeks and ending with an action plan to change race relations in Toledo. There are afternoon groups and there are evening groups as I mentioned, Karen Sheffler has the sign-up sheets, and you can sign up for a certain time slot. It will say like Thursday from 1 to 3, or Tuesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. I signed up this morning. I would love it if like 20 people from the village would sign up to do one of these in January and February. This is an important way that we can be a part of the change that we want to see in Toledo. But finally, I ask you to pray. We can all take a deep breath and pray. Pray for Eric Garner, for his memory, and for all the Eric Garners of this world, and for the police officers, for the children. Pray for the promises that Isaiah makes that are woven into this Advent message. Jesus comes to bring good news to the poor and freedom to the captive. We are surrounded by poor and captive people. And until everyone is free, none of us are truly free. Pray that God might use each one of us to set people free. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Lois forward now. She has a reading for us from our church. so tightly 
the fear of being known, the anxiety of being alone, the anger, the guilt, the pain. Lord, my arms no longer ache. My hands can move again. They can stretch and wiggle. They are open and able to receive. Fill them with your love. Show them how to touch, how to serve. Freed from my own grasp, I am suddenly aware of others. I reach out to my sisters and brothers. Let my hands be your hands as I take their needs and cares and lift them up to you. Give us your sustaining grace. Touch us with your healing love. Take us and shape us together into the body of your Son. Let our hands be your hands to reach out to the world you love.
Jesus, who came to bring good news to the captives, to set us free, to set all of us free, to bring joy into our lives of sadness, to bring light to our darkness. God, we can hardly wait for Christmas, because at Christmas we celebrate the love of Jesus anew. <coughs> so God, we open our hearts before you. Some of us have particular concerns concerns of those who are ill, concerns on our own hearts about decisions we need to make, addictions <coughs> and challenges we're struggling with. God, we know that we can't do it alone, but with you, we can face any challenge. Holy God, we pray for our world. We pray for our country where there is so much unrest and where there is discrimination due to race, due to sexual orientation and gender identity, due to age, due to ability. God, we want to be a church that works for change. We want to be a congregation that sees people as people and celebrates diversity. And so, God, make us strong. Help us to followers in the way of Jesus and help us to be able to speak up when we see injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Help us to live with courage and to be light in the darkness. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will receive our offering now for the ministries of this church. Again, we remind you of our Christmas offering for Imagine Not Malaria. When you get to that offering, just make checks out to the village. You can put them in the Christmas offering envelopes or just write a check and mark it for the Christmas offering. As we pass the basket, we invite everyone to touch the basket, even if you're not putting anything in it today. We invite you to touch the basket, to bless the gifts, and to give thanks for the blessings in your own life.